Well, good morning to you again. The scene now shifts 30 miles north from the shores of Lake Galilee to the foothills of Mount Hermon, or Hermon, depending on how you want to pronounce it, to a place called Caesarea Philippi, or Banyas today. It's part of the Golan Heights, if you want to know where it exists at the moment. So maybe the disciples got their getaway after all, but had to travel quite a way to shake off the crowds. The location is crucial to understanding what happens next, because in the middle of what looks like a prayer vigil, Jesus turns to his disciples and asks, who do the crowds say I am? And the disciples give him the exact same list of possibilities as Herod's acolytes gave him a few verses earlier. Then Jesus asks them directly, and who do you say I am? I imagine that there was a pregnant pause while they all looked at each other and then to spokesman Peter. Peter answers, well, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. And in a way, you wonder why it took so long for the penny to drop. They'd all had front row, ringside seats to watch Jesus dominate death and disease and demons and nature. He'd raised the dead, he'd emulated and trumped Elisha, exhibited mastery over matter with the feeding of the 5,000. Yet to call Jesus Messiah and not just a prophet, that's a step up. And perhaps it's not a surprise that only Big Mouth Peter was prepared to make that leap. I said that the location was important. Caesarea Philippi was a Greco-Roman town. It was strictly off limits to Jews who would never voluntarily defile themselves by entering such pagan idolatrous territory. And the Gospels don't say Jesus actually visited the town itself. Probably he didn't. However, the town itself existed to service the ancient pilgrimage site just outside. And that's where it gets a bit tasty. It had always been an idolatrous site. In Canaanite times, Baal was worshipped there. In 900 BC, King Jeroboam of Israel set up a golden calf just around the corner at Tel Dan, around the other side of the hill. In Greek hands later, it became a shrine to the god Pan, which is where the modern name Panias comes from. And by the time of Jesus, there were no less than five temples to assorted false gods within a very small precinct. The big feature of that area is the huge cave I'm showing you now. Uh, the Jordan used to come from it. It used to be one of the main sources of the River Jordan, and it was in Jesus' day. But after an earthquake in 1000 AD, the water, which is meltwater from Mount Hermon, now emerges just below that. And it was considered to be the gate to the underworld. And devotees of Pan, the god of fertility, would sacrifice their own children by throwing them into the water. Rather appropriately, the cave was known as the Gates of Hell. The whole site was a disgusting, perverted cesspool of evil. I could say more to back that up, but I'd rather spare you. Trust me, you don't want to know. So why did Jesus drag his disciples to this place? Hint, it's not about Jesus competing with false gods and perverted idols, nor was he asking for their opinion on his identity out of personal insecurity and the need to be affirmed. We'll see why tomorrow. But in the meantime, have a muse on what it means to be a part of Messiah Jesus's kingdom. Are there lordship implications that 
you've never quite accepted. Grace and peace to you. And tomorrow we'll get the punchline of this episode. Thank you.